Notice with me as we come here to Psalms chapter 8, again reading in verse 1. Last week I preached a message titled, uh, Creator and Redeemer. And this morning I want to preach a message titled, The Creation of Man. And next week I want to preach a message titled, Jesus in Genesis. And notice with me as we come here to this passage, I actually put music to this psalm about five years ago. We never did sing it. But notice as we begin in verse 1, and we find here, he said, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength because of thine enemies, that thou mightest steal the enemy and the avenger. When I consider... Thy heavens, the work of thy finger, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, yea, and the beast of the field, the fowl of the air, and the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passes through the paths of the sea. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. I want to focus in especially on verse 5. Heavenly Father, we do ask this morning thy blessings, thy anointing upon the reading of Holy Scripture. Father, this morning we ask that you would help us and speak to us as we look into thy word. Lord, speak to us by thy spirit and through thy word. And Lord, to help us with this subject and to come to better understandings that we might be better servants for thee. Father, we thank thee for this day, for it's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. And you may be seated. Psalms 8 is a, is a beautiful hymn of praise addressed to God by David. David is referred to in the Scripture as the sweet psalmist. And this speaks of the Lord's greatness in creation. And as we read in the middle of this passage here in verse 4 and 5, we find that man is pictured as the center of creation. He says here in verse 4, What is man? that thou art mindful of him, and the Son of Man, that thou visitest him. For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. This is a messianic psalm. It is quoted three times in the New Testament in Matthew and Corinthians and Hebrews. We'll probably turn to Hebrews a little later. This refers to God's creation, And it refers to the dominion that God gave man over this earth. All things upon this earth. It does not mention the fall in this passage. We see that as we read through Genesis and we see it in the book of Hebrews and so forth. And when we look at this psalm in verse 1 and in verse 9, it begins and it ends with the subject of praise. But when we come to verse 3 through the end of this psalm, we find that man, and I want to emphasize this, man is the crown of God's creation. This earth is the center of things. God created this earth for man to dwell upon. And man is the crown of God's creation. A lot of people don't like to think of it that way. But we find here that David surveys the firmament, the heavens, and all the greatness of God, and yet he speaks of the crowning act of creation. Verse 2 is quoted by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 2 and verse 16 in his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And we find that he quotes verse 2, when the priest and the scribes would not give glory to him, and the children did. And so that's quoted by our Lord and Savior. Notice with me that as we come to verse 4, we find here, he said, What is man that thou art mindful of him? In other words, we find that God remembered man in this vast universe. Sometimes it's easy to think that God has forgotten about us. But God is mindful of us. He remembers us. 
But not only that, we find that he, he visits a man in this same verse, in, in verse 4. He visits him. In other words, we find as we look at this, that's an act of care. Even when the Lord Jesus Christ came and He pronounced judgment upon Jerusalem and the temple and the people, Leviticus, uh, not Leviticus, but Luke 19, verse 41 through 44, uh, the Lord Jesus talked about uh, God visiting His people, and they weren't even aware of it, most of them. And also we find that man is referred to here in the Old Testament as the Son of Man. Uh, we are uh, descendants of Adam and referred to in, as sons of men. But also the Lord Jesus Christ in the New Testament is referred to as the Son of Man because He took upon humanity so that He could go to the cross and die. But notice now in verse 5, He said, For thou hast made Him a little lower than the angels. What's interesting about that, the angels are servants to men in Hebrews chapter 1. They're ministers to those who are heirs of God. And he says here, verse 5, For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hath crowned him with glory and honor. In other words, this is, this is the, as in the original creation, as we're going to turn to Genesis in a moment, this is the way that it was. Now that's been marred somewhat, not completely lost, but it's been marred. But we find that he's made a little lower than the angels, but he was crowned. He was honor and glory bestowed upon man. And then we find in verse uh, 5 and in verse 6, verse 6, Thou madest him to have dominion, as we'll read in Genesis 1, to have dominion over the works of thy hands, and thou hast put all things under his feet. In other words, God created this earth, created man, placed him upon it, and put him in the Garden of Eden and put him over all things, all plant and animal creation, put him over everything that he would uh, rule and supervise that. Now, I want you to turn with me uh, to the book of uh, Genesis. Notice with me in chapter 1. So, the dominion here speaks of stewardship. And it also, we see this in Genesis chapter 1. Now, you see my outline on the board this morning. Now, I preached along this line of around 2005, a very similar uh, outline. And what I want to do this morning, and uh, using Psalms 8.5 as a springboard, point number one is man's original creation uh, in God's image. And that's important for us to understand because many deny that today. And then secondly, we're going to look at uh, how that man marred that image through sin and rebellion. And then number three, how that man is restored uh, to this image of God through Jesus Christ. Now notice in Genesis chapter 1, I want to read verse 26 through verse 28. And let's talk about man's original creation in the very beginning, created in God's image. He says here, beginning in verse 26, and we're going to come back to this text next week. We were here last week. We're going to come back to it next week and focus in on this subject of the image of God and dealing with Jesus Christ. But he says here in verse 26, And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. And again, next week we're going to talk about the our likeness and our image. We're going to focus in on the fact that Christ was here in the beginning with creation. The New Testament tells us that. And so he says here, And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all things, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. And so God created man in his own image, and in the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Now there's a lot in here that I'm not going to cover this morning. I'm mainly focusing in upon man and the image of God. But there's, there's a lot more given here 
Uh, he's told, as we read in Psalms, uh, similar, he said, be fruitful and multiply. He says, uh, replenish the earth, subdue it, and have dominion. And we've got sermons and articles on that, the importance of that. In other words, God wanted man from the very beginning uh, to have children and raise them up for the glory of God. And we live in a society that not only abort babies, but we live in a society uh, that uh, is big on birth control. And when we go out to the abortion clinic, we deal with, I do anyway, some of the others don't, I deal with both of those issues because they are related. And if you go back to the beginning of Planned Parenthood in, uh, in the early 1920s, and Margaret Sanger, and you look at this, uh, the whole concept of abortion began with the concept that we can control uh, our own destiny. And so God, the first command and blessing in the Bible is that, that, is that man would be fruitful and multiply, and he would replenish, he would subdue, and he would have dominion over this creation that God had put him in. But that's not my subject here this morning. But notice in verse 26 and 27, I want you to see that man was created in God's image. He's superior to all other creatures. And he is to have dominion. He has the ability to understand God and the fellowship with God. In other words, man is given a special place that is totally different from the animal and plant creation and the angelic beings. Because he alone is created in the image of God. And as you read through this chapter and the creation week is unfolding, we find that God reserved the crowning act of creation for the sixth, the end rather, of the sixth day. And he says in verse 26, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And then he said in verse 27, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And then in verse 31, And God saw every thing that he had made, and behold, it was very good. The evening and the morning were the sixth day. So we find here that, that man is created in the image of God. can't say that about the animals and the plant life. You can't say that about the angelic beings. But man alone was created in the image of God. And when we come down to verse 31, and the six days of creation comes to an end, here we find that he not only said this is good, as he said in other places, he said this is very good. So what we're looking at is the very beginning and, the, and, and how that God alone, or I should say God created man alone in his own image. And that's something we need to think about. When we think about God and him creating this universe and, and all that's in it, we find that man alone was created in the image of God. In chapter 2 and verse 7, he became a living soul. In other words, he's created in the image of God, immortal. He has a living soul. Now this image of God that we're considering, I, I could give you many synonyms that would help define it, and you probably have many yourself, but one or two words to me kind of sum it up, and that is a God-likeness. The image of God has to do with a God-likeness. Now, God created the animals and, and everything else, but they don't have a God-likeness. And the same is true of the angelic beings. Even though uh, the higher order of the angels, they do not have what man has. Man has a very special place in the heart of God. Man alone has the capacity for eternal life. Not the animals and not the angels. Man alone has the capacity for moral discernment and to have fellowship with God and to worship God, a self-consciousness, and to have communion with God Almighty. 
And I think when he mentions here, and this is my opinion, but I think when he mentions here that man was created in the image of God, I believe this could include spiritually and morally and physically. You say, what do you mean by that? Well, spiritually, we find as we would read in chapter 3 and verse 8, that man walked with God in the garden and had fellowship with Him. In other words, man was created to have to worship and to have fellowship with his Creator. So spiritually speaking, we bear the image of God. Morally speaking, we bear the image of God. It was God that gave man his moral law. Even in the Garden of Eden, there was a commandment given. They could eat of all that was in the garden except the one tree. So man was given the moral law. And even after man sinned, we know that when Moses led the children of Israel out of Egypt, they went to Mount Sinai, and God gave them His moral law in writing. But another thing, I believe, is that man was created physically in the image of God in the sense in the sense that his body, the body you and I live in here, his body was designed to be like the body that God had planned to, uh, to inhabit in eternity past when he would come into this world to be able to go and die for the sins of humanity. Now think about this body that we live in, this physical body, before man ever created, for God ever created Adam and placed him in, in the garden, God, we, when we speak of God the Son, God the Spirit, and God the Father, we know that in eternity past, God chose and agreed and planned to enter into this world before He created man knowing that He would sin. He, created, he, he chose to come into this world and take upon a body. I believe that that was in God's mind when He created man. In other words, before... I'm not saying this the way I want to say it, the way I've got it in my mind. But I'm just simply saying that our body is designed to, uh, to be like the body that God had planned out before... Um, he ever created Adam and put him in. Does that make sense? I'm not getting this across the way I want to. But I'm saying that, give you an example. In 1 Peter 1.20, before the foundation of the world, it was ordained that Christ would come and die. And in Hebrews 10, verses 5, verse uh, 10, and verse 12, the Bible speaks there of the fact that a body was prepared for the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice he speaks of that and quotes from the book of Psalms, and he's referred to as the man Christ Jesus, as in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5. And so I'm simply saying that this, the, this body that Christ took upon was planned out in eternity past. And so we, in that sense, we could say that we're created spiritually, morally, and physically in the image of God. Now, notice with me, as we come, let me read verse 26 and, and 28 one more time before we uh, move on to our next point. But I'm simply saying there is a huge gap between man and beast. God created it all, but there's a huge gap. There's a special um, difference between man and the angelic beings, which is a higher order, and the animal creation, which is a lower order. Plants possess a body. Animals possess a body and consciousness. But when we come to these verses, man possesses more than just a body and consciousness. In other words, he has an eternal spirit. Okay, And even in Psalms 39 and verse 14, we know that man, we just sang from part of that, man is a complex being. There's no doubt about that. And, and, uh, and much more complex than an animal or a plant or anything else. And we know that man is wiser, according to Job 35.11, than the beast of the field. And we know that. 
And so when we look at this, and and what I got to, I was talking to Brother Ernie this morning in, in Korea, and uh, he was telling me what he had been teaching on in Sunday school in the church there, and he's teaching on children. I said, well, I've got a couple of thoughts on that this morning in my sermon. It's amazing to me that this dumb beast, animals that God created, that they can be trained, and our society doesn't believe that children can be trained. In other words, are they thinking that their child is dumber than a brute beast? And when we, when we look at this, you take, I give an example, dogs and horses. Those are my two favorite animals anyway. And uh, you take dogs, uh, we've not even tried hard with ours. They still need some help and need to be saved. But our dogs can be trained to obey. They can be trained to sit and fetch and all sorts of things. My wife showed me about a three or four minute clip of a, a dog show and dogs just doing all kind of stuff. And I'm sitting there and I said, why can't people train their children? Well, they can't they train them to sit and, and, uh, and to fetch and, and, and to do things. You know, if you can train a dumb animal, why can't we do that with children? Now, our dogs are not very smart. They all got problems. And they all need to be saved. But the thing about it is, that we, even to this point, my wife on Sundays and Wednesdays, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday, she can say it's church day. Our dogs get up and walk to the room that they sleep in until church is over. But we can't train children. What is wrong with our society today? You can take a horse, you can take a horse, you can train it to ride, to pull a wagon, to pull a plow, and you can take an old mule, I'm talking about something thick headed, but they can be trained. They can be, they can be trained, uh, uh, we used to plow with mules and horses, pull wagons. I was talking to Ernie about this this morning. You sound like you're ancient when you talk like this, but I'm from the hills of Tennessee. We actually had horses that pulled a hay rake that didn't have a motor on it and a mowing machine that only way that it would cut grass is when the wheels were turning and we used the horse to pull that. You say, are you 200 years old? We, we mowed hay with that, with a horse and this horse pulling it and the wheels would make the blades turn, hay rakes and all of that. You could train, you could train these mules and these horses to do all of these things. And we live in a society where children are absolutely out of control. Now, you can't do much with them when they're grown and gone, but you can sure do a whole lot with them when they're in your home. And, uh, and so, I just, I told Brother Ernie, I said, I've just got to get off on that just a few minutes. And he'd been preaching on the same thing, and he's, he said, uh, had a few kind of not so friendly smiles, you know, while he was speaking on that there this morning. Now, when we come to this subject, and we consider in verse 26, we're talking about the original creation of man in God's image. A perfect environment, a perfect world, no sin, placed in the Garden of Eden. And, and we find here in verse 26, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. Verse 27, and so God created man in His own image. In the image of God created He Him. Male and female created He them. And that's an amazing statement that God looked upon us this way. That He created us in His image. And He loved us so much. He visited man. He was concerned about man. Uh, he looks upon our affairs. Sometimes we don't think that He does. But God loved us so much that He created us in His own image. That's an amazing statement within itself. Especially when we live in the world, that in, in the school system, the political system, and around us that, that believes in evolution, 
Now, I told you last week, Genesis is much more than a book to try to prove that evolution is wrong. It's a book dealing with the Creator and the Redeemer. We see this all through the book of Genesis, especially in the beginning. I mentioned to you before a number of times the Scopes trial, referred to as a monkey trial, that took place in 1925 in Dayton, Tennessee. That's my hometown. And evolution was forbidden to be taught in the school system there in that state, and I think most states. The trial was arranged by the ACLU. And it was to stop the teaching of creation and discredit the Bible. Is that ACLU or AL, whichever it is, I think it's ACLU. And the first time that creation was challenged in the classroom, kind of laid a foundation to start getting their way into the public school. Not that the public school was fantastic before that. But we find that this was a great event. It was covered uh, by over 200 reporters. And it was the first time that a trial had been broadcasted nationally. My grandfather was young, but he was at uh, that particular trial. William, uh, that trial, Williams Jennings Bryan debated the evolutionists and the atheists and whatever in that trial. But that even though the creationists won, that still opened a door for what we have now throughout the school system. When we come to this subject and consider this, no matter where you look in our society, where it's the state parks, uh, you know, millions and billions of years old, or it's television, the theaters, the school systems, no matter where you go, this theory is taught today. I went online about two weeks ago, and I'm thinking about preaching a few sermons this year, and uh, I, I wanted to do some reading on the movies that are being produced this year and next year. Do you know that nearly every one of them that I looked at is centered around witchcraft, evolutionary mindset, Satanism? They're producing a new one, Avatar, that came out ten years ago. I've never seen it, but I've seen the pictures and I've read about it. And, and it has human-animal creatures in it. Humans with tails like animals and things of that nature. And then a new Star Wars movie. That's been one of those popular things. That thing is satanic, it's wicked, it's out of hell, and it's to draw people away from the truth of the Word of God. Coming out either this year, I think in the fall, with Frozen 2. And Frozen 1, Disney, came out a couple of years ago. And there's a song, Let It Go. And people walk around, I hear them in Walmart and places singing that, and they've never looked at the words. Never considered. They just kind of go through it. And again, filled with witchcraft, Satanism, and all these things. And so this is what we're up against in our society. And this is why I want to keep emphasizing this morning, I've said it about ten times, we were created in... God's image. I'm going to say that again. And so that means, if we accept that, that means that we're accountable to Him. He not only created us and loves us and cares for us, but we are accountable unto God. Now turn to Genesis chapter 3. They're real close and notice here. In Genesis chapter 3. Now the second thing I want to point out, and again, I'm just... Pick some select verses because you could spend all day on this subject. And you could read all of Genesis 1 and 2 and look at all the details. But notice in Genesis chapter 3, my second point is man marred that image through sin and rebellion. Now what do we mean by that? Well, the human race has fallen from its original state. We're, we've fallen into sin and the curse. Now, notice with me, as we come down here to chapter 3, and I'm, again, I'm not going to deal with all the details in here and where Satan enters into the garden and deceives uh, our, our first parents, but notice as we come down to about verse 15. This is 
And I'm going to come back to verse 15 next week in dealing with Jesus and Genesis. But notice in verse 15, God speaking to the serpent. And after the sin in here in the garden, after Adam and Eve had sinned. And it says here in verse 15, And I'll put enmity, that is hatred, between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Look at that next week. Verse 16. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception, and sorrow thou shalt bring forth children. Thy desire shall be to thy husband. He shall rule over thee. And Adam said, and unto Adam he said, rather, because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hath eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake, and sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to, to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. Verse 19, In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground, for out of it was thou taken, for dust thou art, and to the dust thou shalt return. Now I'm skipping a lot, but I, we see here the fall of man. The reason I call it the, the image is marred, it's not totally destroyed and taken away. The reason I say that, James 3 9 says, Therewith bless, speaking of the tongue, therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men which are made after the similitude of God. And in 1 Corinthians eleven seven, speaking of man, he is the image and glory of God. The image is still there, it's defaced some, it's been marred, but the image is still there. But we find that man had fallen in the sin. And we, as we look here in chapter 2, in verse 17, the Lord had told them, told Adam, He said, But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou shalt that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. And here's the thing. We think about death and all die. And I've asked a lot of people, where did death come from? And it comes right out of the scripture. Very clearly. And so, it is appointed a man wants to die, and after this, the judgment. The wages of sin is death. And so, we find here in chapter 2 and verse 7, death is a result of sin and the curse that was placed upon man. Notice in Genesis 5. In Genesis 5, and by the way, Adam and Eve were run out of the garden after the following verses where I just read in chapter 3. But I'm saving as much time as I can for the New Testament. And so I'm skipping a lot of verses. But notice in chapter 5, verses 1 through 5, again, we see this this story of creation. He said in verse 1, This is the book of the generation of Adam. In the day that God created man, in the likeness of God made he him. Male and female created he them and blessed them and called their name Adam. In the day when they were created, and Adam lived in 130 years and begat a son in his own likeness after his image and after his, and called his name Seth. But notice as we come and we see the length of Adam's life and then verse 5, all the days that Adam lived were 930 years. And what's the last three words? And this is the obituary chapter. We find the first natural death here in this chapter. Now, Abel was murdered in chapter 4. We see the consequences of this sin, this rebellion, and this curse in the same family that rebelled against God. But in verse 8, and he died. In verse 11, and he died, the latter part. Verse 14, and he died. Verse 12, and he died. He's going through a list of genealogy. Verse 20, and he died. In verse 27, and he died. 
And we have to ask the question, where did death come from? Why do we die? If we're evolving and things are supposed to be improving, why do we still die? Turn with me to Romans chapter 5. And notice here. As we come through the Scripture, we know that in the beginning man lived to be many years old. But it seems it leveled out when we get to the book of Psalms, we read in Psalms chapter 90 uh, that the average lifespan is 70 years. Now, many don't make it to 70, and many go beyond 70. But that's an average. Notice as we come to Romans chapter 5. Last year, I took an obituary column from a paper for a solid week. And I went through the whole thing for a solid week. And I, I don't remember what my sermon was I did this for. And there are those died as children, as teenagers in their 20s and 30s. and Because you got several people throughout a week in, in, in a town that died. And some of them in their 70s, some in 80s, even 90s. But when I put all of these together, these obituaries, for one whole week, and I put them all together, the average was 71. Taken from those died as a child to those in their 90s, the average was 71. Isn't that amazing that uh, that kind of lines up with the Bible a little bit? We find that again in Psalms chapter 90. I believe it's verse 10. It's, uh, it's verse 10, 11, and 12. I believe it's the three verses because he tells us in verse 12, teach us to number our days because our days are so short. All die. No one can beat it. Where did this come from? The curse. Man marred the image that he was created with through sin and rebellion, and God placed a curse, not only upon man himself, but upon all creation. And we see that here in Romans 5 and Romans chapter 8. But notice in Romans 5, and he says here, and again, I am skipping a lot of things, but I'm not picking and choosing to avoid the context. I'm just trying, i got other verses I want to go to. But notice... In chapter 5, he begins with the peace of God and justification. He tells us that man, in verse 6, is ungodly. In verse 8, he's a sinner. And in verse 10, he's an enemy of God. That's why we need to be saved. He tells us in verse 9 that we're justified by His blood. Verse 10, we're reconciled unto God through Jesus Christ. And in verse 11, those of us who are saved, we have now received the atonement. But verse 12 is what I want. He said in verse 12, He said, Wherefore is by one man... This is what people deny today. When they deny the Bible, they deny the fact that they're created in God's image. And they deny the fact that we're accountable to God. I tell people, I say, just try not to die and we'll see how, how well that works out for you. Try not to die. I sat down with a man in Tennessee three years ago that's a relative. And we were facing death with someone else there. And they died that week. And this man always jokes everything off. I love him, but he's still he's lost. Always jokes about everything. And I sat him down and I said, we're facing death here in this room. And I said, I want you to exceed. You deny God His existence. I said, I want you to tell me where death comes from. I said, we can, we can show many scriptures about the average age, where, why death entered into the world in the Garden of Eden, and the consequences of that. It's pointed to man once to die, and after this, a judgment. I went through all of, all of that. He finally sobered up. He did not get saved, but First time, he did not laugh it off. I said, look, we're facing death. This person is dying. 
And I said, you're going to die and I'm going to die. Why? Because of the fact that man marred the image of God through sin. This is why we suffer. This is why we see so much pain and suffering and misery in this world. And and there's people suffering from sickness and pain uh, that, that they didn't bring that upon themselves. Now, some do through alcohol and drugs and a number of things. But we live in a world that's sick. Suffering. Even the creation is suffering. And he said in verse 12, Wherefore this by one man sin entered in the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. In verse 13 and 14, he speaks of the death from Adam to Moses and down to where we're at right now. Why do we die? Why do we get sick? We live in a sick world and we can't fix it and we can't change it. But we can prepare for a place where we will receive a new glorified body, live with the Lord in eternity in the new heavens and the new earth. Notice in Romans 8. Notice in Romans 8 while we're here. Death is a result of sin. There is no billions of years. There was no death before the, for the sin of Adam and Eve. There was no death. And I believe in a young earth, but also believe that the young earth looks old because of sin and rebellion and the curse. I believe this earth is less than 10,000 years of age. And you say, well, why does it look so the way it is? Well, it's young, but it looks old because of sin. Have you ever seen folks that maybe even their 30s or 40s or early 50s that's lived a horrible life of drunkenness and drugs and they look like they're twice the age that they're... Well, that's what's wrong with this earth. This earth is under a curse because of sin. And notice this. He says here in Romans chapter 8, and I'm, I'm reading from about verse 18, he said, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waited for the manifestation of the sons of God. Notice this world. This world is waiting for the resurrection of of the sons of God at the return of Jesus Christ, and it will be fixed as well. We will not only receive glorified bodies, we'll read some verses in a moment, but this world will be fixed and restored. But he goes on to say in verse 20, For the creature was made subject to vanity not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Now watch verse 22. And he says here, And we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. The whole creation was thrown into this chaotic condition because of sin. The creation didn't sin against God. And it's thrown into this chaotic condition. And and we can be saved and live right and things can still come into our life. We will eventually die. We can have sickness. All we got to do is go through the Bible and look at those that had tremendous sickness. It's Paul himself that writes this letter and gives us over half of the New Testament. Uh, He had Satan, a a messenger of Satan, to buffet him. He had a thorn in the flesh. I mean, if Paul walked in most pulpits today and was going to preach, they probably wouldn't even let him in the pulpit if they could see what he looked like, his appearance, and the things that he went through for Christ's sake. But then he says in verse 23, He said, and not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan. How many have ever groaned in this world that we live in? 
and the things that we deal with. Whether it be physical infirmities or emotional pain, he says, and, and we ourselves groan within ourselves waiting, waiting for the adoption to wit that is to be made known and what? What's the next part of it? Somebody tell me. The redemption of our body. Our bodies are under a curse and must be redeemed, must be changed, must be restored, and it will be in resurrection. And, and so we see here that man marred that image. And, and as we look through the Scripture, we see the damage of this sin in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1, 2, and 3. We walked according to the course of this world uh, before we were saved. We were dead in trespasses and sins. Dead to the, not physically, but dead to the things of God. And then, and if, even in Ephesians 4, if you'll turn there, he describes humanity in Ephesians chapter 4. See, we, we that were dead in trespasses and sins in Ephesians 2 were quickened by the Spirit. Now, I'm going, to, I'm going to get to this in the remaining of our time, get to this third point. We were quickened. We've been made alive. What does that mean? Well, notice as we come to Ephesians 4, verse 17 through 19, he said, This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk, in the vanity of their mind, having their understanding darkened. Notice this being alienated. Notice that being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their hearts. He goes on to list some other things. So we see here the damage of sin. We see here the sad state of the lost world that we live in. And we groan within ourselves, even we that are saved sometimes, especially some of the things that we go through in life. The whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain. Now, let's talk about the old and new man for a few moments. Notice as we read, and again, I'm skipping around. I beg of you to go and read the entire context in the chapter. But notice he mentions in verse 22 of Ephesians 4, he said, And that you put off concerning the former conversation the old man which is cropped according to the deceitful lust. The old man, or a similar statement, is mentioned here. Colossians 3, Romans chapter 6, Romans 13. It's referred to the, just the flesh, the works of the flesh, in Galatians 5.19. The old man is a description of what we were in Adam as a result of sin before we were saved by the grace of God. The old man, the flesh. 1 Corinthians 15.22 And Adam all die, in Christ shall all be made alive. So there's two groups of people that live in the world. Those who are in Adam, talking about positionally speaking, spiritually speaking, and those that are in Christ. So when you see the old man or the flesh, that's what it's referring to. That describes everything that we were in Adam. You remember that Adam was created in the image of God. Then Adam had a son in his image. We bear the image of God, but yes, we bear the image of Adam as well. The sin nature. The Adamic nature, the lower nature that we were born with. Now let's talk about the new man. Notice in verse 23 and verse 24. He says in verse 23, and be renewed. Now you're going to see some words like changed, renewed, born again, regenerated. And let's come now to our third point, man's restoration of God's image. This is how that it takes place. It's through the new birth. It's through regeneration. 
those who are saved, they have, they're a new man. And he says in verse 23, And be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which after God, notice, is created, creation language, is created in righteousness and true holiness. So when a person is saved, born again, they still live in this body of flesh, got to deal with it, but they're referred to as new creatures in Christ Jesus. And he says here that as being a new man, we are to put on the things of the new man. Because that new man is created in righteousness and true holiness. Notice with me in Ephesians 2. So when we talk about the new man, it is a description of what we are in Christ as a result of righteousness. There, see this cycle? We are originally created perfect and placed in a perfect environment. And then sin entered in and marred that and defaced it. But through Jesus Christ... All of this is being restored. Some of it's already been restored. Other parts of it will be restored in resurrection. Notice in Ephesians chapter 2, though, speaking to those who are saved, he says in verse 10, after telling us how that we're saved, in verse 8 and 9, he says in verse 10, for we are his workmanship, what's the next word? Created. You're going to find this a lot in the New Testament dealing with regeneration. So he says here, For we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Amazing statement. So we are His workmanship. And we have been created in Christ Jesus. We're not saved by good works, we're saved in nine, but we're saved unto good works. And we've been created in Christ Jesus unto good works. God has ordained this. He's ordained this before the foundation of the world. Notice in Colossians chapter 3. Now what I'm going to do, I'm going to skip Hebrews 8, I'm sorry, Hebrews 2, 5 through 8. I'd encourage you to read it because it's a quotation from Psalms 8 where we started. And as we look at it, we see that we don't see this completely restored yet. But he says, not yet, but he says, but we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels to, to take our humanity and to die for us, and to redeem us. And throughout that chapter, it speaks of Christ's accomplishments for you and I. Now notice in Colossians chapter 3, and I'm reading just one verse, Colossians chapter 3, and notice with me in verse 10. We find here in verse 10, and he said this, now, now in verse 8 and 9, he's talking about putting off something. And in verse 12 and verse 14, he's talking about putting on something. In verse 10, And have put on, notice, the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of Him that created Him. He's speaking, we've got an entire sermon on this verse. He's speaking of regeneration. He's speaking of the new birth. He's speaking of the indwelling Holy Spirit and the divine nature. Notice with me in 2 Peter. Notice in 2 Peter reading in chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. We find here in this passage, I'm beginning in verse 1, Simon Peter, a servant, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith, with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Now notice the next two verses. He said in verse 3, For according as His divine power hath given unto us things 
that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of Him that hath called us to glory and virtue. Now here's a verse I'm really after. Whereby are given unto us exceeding and great and precious promises, that by these you might be, notice, partakers, notice, of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Those who are saved, they have a divine nature. This divine nature, this new nature, is, renew, is a renewal of the image of God. In other words, as, as a person is saved, born again, born of the Spirit, as John 3 and other places says, this restoration begins in salvation. He begins renewing our heart and our mind. And the resurrection of the body will come later. And so we that are saved, we have a divine nature. This has to do with God's holiness and His perfection that He's placed within us. And we find that, again, this restoration of this image, it begins in the heart and the mind through salvation, through regeneration, and then it will end in resurrection when Christ comes and all things are made new. Now I want you to think about this. When we read Genesis a moment ago, when we, and we didn't read all the verses, but He said, in the day that you eat thereof, you shall surely die. Well, Adam lived to be 900 and something years of age. He died that very day spiritually to the things of God. And He died hundreds of years later, or however long it was, physically. Well, think about this. When this image is being restored, we are restored first spiritually by the new birth as we just were new creatures. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We are new creatures. We are restored spiritually. And then years later, we have that complete restoration. Notice in 2 Corinthians, all of you can quote this. He says in verse 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, and the issue is being in Christ. Amen? In Adam all die, and Christ shall all be made alive. We have all spiritual blessings in Christ in Ephesians 1. So he says here in verse 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. In other words, he is a new creation. A creature is a product of a created act. So there, we have creation language, as I talked to you last week, dealing with the Creator and the Redeemer. We have creation talk or language as we see in Genesis. When we come into the New Testament in Christ, through Christ, and we talk about the new birth and God restoring that image. It began spiritually. And we will receive a body like the Lord Jesus Christ when the dead are raised. That's a promise to you and I. In 2 Corinthians 3, verse 17 and 18, he says in verse 17, Now the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Now watch verse 18, But we all, with open face, beholding, as in a glass, that's like the Word of God, he says the glory of the Lord, now watch this, and are changed. Think about this. And are changed into the same image, from glory to glory, that is, from one degree to the next. And he says, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. See, that transformation begins taking place inside of a person when they are regenerated. That image is starting to be restored, spiritually speaking. And we will be like the Lord Jesus Christ whenever the saints are raised again. 
In 1 John 3 and verse 2, he says, When he shall appear, we shall be like him. And in the, in, in the book of Philippians, I'm not asking you to turn there, but in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 20 and 21, said, For our conversation is in heaven from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now listen to this. Use the word change here as in 1 Corinthians. And he says, Who shall change our vile body? This body is under a curse. This body is dying. This body is sinful. The Bible speaks of the works of the flesh in contrast to the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5. And it says, Who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto His glorious body according to the working whereby He is able even to subdue all things unto Himself. That is when the final restoration of the image of God will be completed. That's amazing to me. That's something to say amen about. That's something to rejoice about. Because we didn't ask to get into this mess necessarily, but we're in it. And the Lord, again, He's mindful of us, as in Psalms 8. And He loves us. And He planned out our redemption before He ever created man and created this earth. He planned it all out. If you would turn with me to 1 Corinthians 15, and here's where we're going to close. Notice in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. As we look through the Scriptures, we find that that in Titus 2.13, if you're taking notes, that it is referred to as that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Many places. It's estimated 1,800 references in the Old Testament for His coming. It's estimated, I've never counted them all, but it's estimated about 300 references to the second coming of Christ in the New Testament. As He was prophesied to come the first time, He will come the second time without sin unto salvation. In Romans 8, it's referred to as this part of the verse, we're predestinated to be conformed to the image of His Son. That's enough, but we got hundreds of other verses. We're predestinated, marked off beforehand. When a person becomes a Christian, they are from that moment predestinated to be conformed to the image of God's Son. Amazing statements. We are today the temple of God in 2 Corinthians 6, verse 16 through 17, and the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, dwells inside. That's the new nature that dwells within us. Now notice with me as we come here to our last passage. We find beginning in this passage, this whole chapter, 58 verses, is a defense of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and a defense of the resurrection of the saints of God. Verse 1 through 4. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preach unto you, which also ye have received and wherein you stand. By which also you're saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. Here it is. Why well, delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He, uh, and, and and that He rose from again from the dead, according to the Scripture. So He begins with the gospel and how to be saved. He begins here with the death, burial, and the resurrection of Christ to prove in this chapter that those who are in Christ, that they also will be raised from the dead. This is the only hope we have. There's no hope in this world. I've watched over the years, and especially in the last five years, there have been about three different people that have died. One, I believe, was the richest woman in the world. Nothing could save her. Uh, I could start naming names. This one man that had millions and billions of dollars. I think he spent a million dollars alone on one blood type research trying to find a way for him to live. And you know what happened to him? He died. 
he died, one out of one dies. I heard the other day the number one kill in the world is still death. You say, what does that mean? We die. Yeah, we die. And then the judgment on top of that. So let's close in the latter part of this chapter reading from, and we're going to be back in this chapter next week, but let's begin reading in verse 50 through 58. And here is where that we will close. The point is, resurrection... In resurrection, the process of this image being restored is completed in resurrection. It started at the new birth and it's completed in resurrection. Now somebody can't say hallelujah, we need to quit. Verse 50. Now just notice the verses. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, Need to do with corruption, inherit incorruption. This is why we've got to be saved. We can't get into God's kingdom in this body, in flesh and blood. We must be born again. We have to be saved. We have to be regenerated. And then he says in verse 51, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be... What's the next word? See, pay attention to those words. Created in Christ Jesus. We shall be changed. Why do we need to be changed? We're dying. Every year goes by, Brother Abe and I is counting gray hair. We're dying. Now, I don't want to sound pessimistic this morning, but there's hope in Jesus Christ and only in Him. And that complete image, complete image of God will be restored in full in resurrection. He says in verse 52, In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be, somebody say it, changed. Wow, there it is again. Verse 53, and this corruptible must put on incorruption, this mortal must put on immortality, speaking of our body. And so when this corruption shall have put on incorruption, this mortal shall have put on immortality, then, then, resurrection, then, then shall be brought to pass a saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy, thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But notice, but thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through Jesus, through our Lord, rather, Jesus Christ. We have victory. God has taken the stinger out of death. We all will die. And there's, there's, there's thousands that die in this world every day. I think it's over 200,000 and over a million a week. And it's just a fact of life. I wish I could stop it and I know you wish you could stop it. We can stop it. Sickness and death and the whole creation is groaning. We groan within ourselves. But we must, we must cling to God. As the old song, where else can I go but to the Lord? There's no... Go check it out. The atheists don't have an answer. The evolutionists, they don't have an answer. I mean, there's no other answer. The only answer we have is in the Holy Scripture that God has given to us. This is the only hope that we have. Now, let me say this for us Christians in closing. Verse 58. What's the first word? Somebody tell me. You know what the therefore means? When you see therefore, look and see what it's there for. It's there to show us, hey, let's serve God. Let's serve God. He says here in verse 50, Therefore, my beloved, that's in view of 57 verses trying to prove that the resurrection of Christ is true and the resurrection of the saints will come to pass. 57 verses and then he says, therefore... My beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor 
is not in vain in the Lord. Our time here together is not in vain. Your time trying to raise children or trying to live for the Lord, your time in serving the Lord, whatever capacity that is, it is not in vain. It is not in vain. And the older I get, the more that I see this. I told a brother yesterday that came and picked up that machine. We're talking. He's 72. I'm 66. I said, I just want to finish well. And uh, we're talking about, you know, what else is there to live for? Nothing else worth living for except the Lord. Because as appointed a man wants to die, and after that the judgment, there is a resurrection. And in these passages, it's clear that we shall be changed physically and I have a glorified body resembling the Lord Jesus Christ. Would you stand with me? Oh, if you're not saved, let this be the day that you trust Him with all your heart. We that are saved, let us keep our eyes upon the Lord. Father, we thank Thee for this day. We thank Thee for Your love, mercy, and grace to us. For the salvation that You've given to us so freely in Jesus Christ. Father, help us to reflect upon these truths. Lord, there in Psalms, You're mindful of us. You're concerned about us. When You created us, You're so concerned about us. You prepared a Redeemer. And Father, help us to realize that, that You do love us, even when it feels lonely sometimes. Lord, help us to realize that You love us and You care for us. But Lord, help us to realize too, we live in a sick world. And our hope is not in this world, but it's in Thee and in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we look one day for Thy coming. For it's in Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen.